Okay. I want to speak in defense of magpies. You know, for those of you who live in southern Alberta, northern Montana, um, or for those who have been following my channel, you're probably aware by now over the past week that this is the time of year when the magpie fledglings are leaving the nest. You know, a lot of the nests now are going to be like this one here. Nobody home because they're out foraging with their parents you know learning their learning their culture their way of life and I start getting a lot of magpie calls as you've as you've seen if you follow my channel um, I get the first wave I get are the fledglings that are just out of the nest a little bit too early you know or that people perceive to be have been abandoned that kind of thing um, and we've seen some of that over the last week what I dread is the next wave that's coming because the next wave is when the parents of the of the magpies start bringing their broods out onto the roads to learn how to clean up our roadkill you know all the all the ground squirrels and stuff that we hit the magpies are, are the cleanup crew for that and so there's going to be a lot of fledglings on the road training and they look you know to the untrained eye like an adult bird um, and so a lot of them are getting wiped out, or are gonna be here, as they do every year. You start seeing magpie, dead magpie fledglings all over the roads. Um, and those that don't get killed, get busted up, and a lot of them get brought to me to try to, uh, to, try to mend, and you know, hopefully get them out to be in birds again, and if not, at least um, doing you know, finding them an adoptive home or something like that. So, I, yeah, I don't look forward to that, but I know it's going to happen and people, because people don't slow down for the birds. Um, you know, if you perceive it as an adult bird and you're used to just driving along and adult birds will get out of your way, which they will, um, you're just going to end up accidentally plowing right through it. Nobody likes to hit birds, right? So. I, I, I strongly recommend if you see birds on the road, just assume that they're fledglings. Assume that this is their day number one of training on the road and slow down for them. Give, give them time to learn their, learn their trade. <laughs> um, the other thing that I want to talk about in defense of the magpies was that there's been an article circulating recently in one of the neighborhoods in Lethbridge um, and it's kind of a highbrow neighborhood. There's a lot of university professors and stuff that, that live there. And one of the residents is a, is a published author of books on both indigenous plants and, um, and gardening. And so, you know, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's got several books out. He does good presentations. A lot of people look up to him for nature advice. And this gentleman recently put an article in his neighborhood uh, newsletter advocating that his neighbors um, try to evict the magpies by interfering with their nesting and what he was, what he was basically saying was that before there were going to be babies and so you know turn him back a month or so when this is six weeks a month two months back when this probably was originally circulated I only just now heard about it but he was saying if you if you have magpie nests in your bushes or trees get them out of there if you see them building them you know wreck them before they get babies and that kind of thing and he gave some reasons for why he thought that they should do this um, but I want to talk about that because I believe that all of his reasons are false he has three main reasons and I'm going to talk about them I believe they're all false, uh, or at least seriously misleading. And then um, I know that that mindset comes from that European tradition where magpies and crows are persecuted. They've been long persecuted in that tradition because of their association with death. Because, you know, they, they are opportunists and they will eat off of dead carcasses human or otherwise, right? And so, um, and they're fairly synanthropic and people tend to, in that tradition, 
people tend to demonize the synanthropic animals, the ones that live closely with humans. So I, I know that that's the, the voice that it's coming from. Because if it came from a voice that cared about our local traditions here <laughs> that go back 10,000 plus years, um, then he would know that human beings and magpies are like this or at least have been up until a hundred years ago, really closely associated. Um, in the Blackfoot tradition, which is the tradition of this territory here, northern Montana, southern Alberta, um, in the Blackfoot tradition, the people always lived with corvids, with the crows and the magpies. The men originally lived with the crows, the women originally lived with the magpies. And they were the hunting partners. And then when the two camps, men and women, eventually merged, um, then, you know, you had both. I have old photographs of, of families that have magpies, that uh, they have kind of um, willow, round willow uh, magpie uh, cages and this kind of thing for their pets, for their hunting partners. <laughs> And I feel like, you know, I've spent enough time out here in the coolies. My feeling is that the magpies are just waiting for us to act human again. Because if you pay attention to them out here, they will tell you where their animal's hidden. Because they want you to hunt. Because they want to have their peace, right? We were, we were close, close, close. Um, when Lewis and Clark came through Montana, they wrote in their journals when they came through northern Montana in Blackfoot territory, they wrote in their journals that the magpies were walking into their tents and eating from their hands. So that tells you what the relationship used to be like. Heck, you look at the opener to my videos. What do I have on there? I have an otter, I have a rattlesnake, I have a magpie. There's a reason for that. <laughs> magpies are important here. Um, they, they gave a lot to Blackfoot culture. I won't go you know, through everything. You know, they're associated with weather dancing, they're associated with beaver bundles, they're associated with women, there's a magpie society, um, you know, a social group that a lot of the recent, you know, high elders of the horns formed. So, when I run into this news that, <laughs> that a pretty well-known naturalist, um, is advocating that his neighbors push the magpies out of their neighborhood I, I take you know I take f offense to that um, <laughs> and there's reasons why he says that they should do this but uh, let's talk about those reasons because I think they're all three of them are bullshit first reason he says is because the magpie nest is too heavy it's gonna make you it's gonna kill your bushes going to make your bush fall over or you know drop some limbs off your tree and that kind of thing um, it's going to injure your your plants basically now I've I've been studying out here for almost two decades um, and I've seen a lot of magpie nests and I have on occasion encountered situations where like a bullberry bush like this with a heavy magpie nest has fallen over um, whether it fell over because of the weight of the nest exactly or not, or because it's got heart rot like a lot of, of uh, bullberry bushes do get as they mature, in a or a combination of that, I don't know. But I see it pretty rarely. I think I could count, you know, less than a dozen times that I've encountered that in, in, in over the years. Um, but if you walk around and look around out here, and in the neighborhoods too, you're going to see lots of magpie nests, but you're not going to see a lot of evidence of bushes and trees falling over as a result. It happens. It's rare. Not rare enough that you won't find it if you're looking, but it's, it's relatively rare, and I think it's irresponsible to trump up fear about it. Next thing. We have to worry because magpie feces is toxic and um, our kids could get sick. This one I find really insidious because you're pulling on the heartstrings of people, you know, saying you got to worry because your kids. 
but um, when was the last time you've known any kids getting sick because of exposure to magpie um, droppings? And is it just magpie droppings, you know, that you're concerned about? Or what about robins? There's a lot of robins in the neighborhoods. There's a lot of house sparrows, a lot of flickers. Are we worried about their droppings? I don't think so, because there's really not a worry, right? We lived around magpies for thousands of years. Nobody gets sick from magpie droppings. I have two pet magpies that are rescue birds living in my home. I've been living with magpie for seven years. I'm in close proximity in my whole family and our kids and our nieces and nephews and everything. Um, nobody's ever got sick from magpie droppings being around and we're close to that stuff. Like we're in it, right? Now I'm not saying that you can't go on the computer and Google up toxic bird droppings and you're going to find scientific evidence that um, people who work closely around birds can get sick from the bird droppings. That's out there. That evidence is there. It's proven. But that's a whole different thing than a bird who's living in a neighborhood um, <laughs> going around and doing its usual thing and pooping and such. Um, I, I call bullshit on that. You know, I don't think there's any fear at all to be had, but that's what was in the article, to my understanding. Bullshit number three. <laughs> this is the third and final argument why the neighbors should coax magpies away. And that is because the magpies kill songbirds. Again, you know drawing on the heartstrings because of course there's people in the neighborhood who are feeding songbirds and enjoying them and magpies are killing them what they kill them well <laughs> I'll tell you this magpies do go after eggs they're egg eaters at one point in the season early on in the season as this as we first are shifting into from winter to summer um, but it's, you know, at this point, not so much, right? Um, as they're nesting and that kind of thing, they're not, they're not going after eggs. Uh, if you know their diet and you watch what they're actually eating and follow them around, they're not out there raiding nests for the most part. They're out there getting insects right now. Um, do, are they going to take an actual bird off your bird feeder and eat it? There's a possibility that they will do that, but it's not a big part of their diet, you know? magpie might do that once a year maybe maybe not even um, they'll take mice too is that a bad thing <laughs> are we worried about the mice no we're worried about the songbirds if you actually look up what a songbird is you'll find out that magpies are a songbird so it's silly even to even to say oh they kill a songbirds well they are a songbird and what about you know if this isn't just a persecution of the magpies what about the northern shrike? Should we be um, upset about the northern shrikes in our region? Because the northern shrike is 100% diet small birds. Haven't seen an article or heard about an article from anyone who's wanting to get rid of those northern shrike. Another one that lives in our neighborhoods that we see a lot are the merlins. Their diet's almost 100% those small birds. Are we worried about the merlins? No. Magpie's diet is not 100% small birds. It's probably not even 1% small birds. I would, I would hazard to say <laughs> it might be 1 1,000th, something like that. Maybe not even that, that high. So I, I'm calling bullshit on that level too. And uh, I think it's just that, that European mindset, the persecution of the magpies, the hatred of them. And I admit, you know, this time of year, magpies are highly visible and they can be very annoying because um, the adults are going to be defending the, the fledglings. So they're going to be given alarm calls when people are coming near. And though that alarm call is meant to be to cause alarm, right? <laughs> and it does. It rings in our ears. We don't like it. And the other noise that we don't like is the fledglings themselves begging for food. Um, 
And so people are going to feel like there's more magpies around and the magpies are being super noisy and they're just being assholes and they're not. We're talking about babies, baby crying. That's what we're dealing with for the most part. Babies crying. And, you know, babies crying is supposed to get our attention. It's supposed to be something that we want to stop. And that's what it's meant to be for the magpie parents too. So we got to give them a break. You know, they're living organisms and they're indigenous to here. They've been here thousands of years. They belong here. They're synanthropic. We live for so long as symbionts with them. Our, our, I, I feel like our genetics are most certainly closely tied with them. I revere the magpies because of what I call in which is the being very highly aware. They know everything that's going on in their environment. If I want to learn some things, one of the best way to do it is just to go out and, and learn from the magpies because they'll show you what's going on. <laughs> so yeah, this is my defense of the magpies. Very disappointed that that article's come out. We got to remember that gardeners, um, you know, and people that know about biology are not necessarily naturalists, do not necessarily know ecology and cannot be trusted to speak on, uh, you know, in regard to every species out there. Um, and anytime I think that somebody is telling you we need to get rid of these animals, um, <laughs> you, you should say what, what the heck is up with that, right? They're, you know, it's not like they're inside the attic or something like that. They're outside doing their thing. So that's my, that's my perspectives and I'm going to put it out there on my channel because I know I've got an audience in Lethbridge and I hope that I am able to dissuade some people from believing in those myths.